Today, um, I want to focus on two things. One, I'm hoping to, that you see your business in a whole new light, through a different lens, as it were. Um, and uh, so to do that, I want to show you a model that, um, uh, that will help you ultimately to see that through a new lens. Number two is uh, I want to give you practical tools to help you to get a grip on your business, ultimately to help organize it and uh, be able to get more traction in your business. So um, to do that, um, I want to go through uh, these principles, but I want you f first to um, go through where all this started from. So the discovery was this, that most businesses have one of these five frustrations. So the frustration of a lack of control. So they just don't feel like they have complete control over the business. You know, you hear people saying, oh, the business runs me, I don't run the business. Profits, uh, if you're not paying attention, these are frustrations, so not having enough. Um, not having ultimately enough money coming in. <clears throat> Next is people. Are you truly getting everything you want out of all your people? And that uh, we found actually in um, some research that we just have done recently that that is the, the number one thing. We're just not getting everything we need out of all of our people. Next is hitting the ceiling. Best way to put this is what got you here won't get you there. All businesses will get to a point that um, they will hit a ceiling. You'll feel stuck, things will get complex, and when you get to that point, you have to revolutionize the way that you run your business. And last is nothing's working. So you're trying a bunch of things, but nothing's sticking, nothing's working, um, and it really ultimately seems to get frustration. You feel like the wheels are spinning. So the discovery was that most businesses, or many businesses, have one of these five frustrations, or multiple of these five frustrations. But there was a select few that didn't. And the interesting thing about this select few, and then all the research showed that they also were more profitable than other organizations. So more profitable, more fun, less frustrations. If that's something you're into, you're at the right talk. If not, sorry, hopefully you can push through. Um, so, um, but at the center of this is, uh, is your business. So let's say this, um, this presentation is about you, not me. The person sitting in your seat is the reason that I'm here. So understand that, get what you want out of this, uh, this presentation, this topic. So if there's something I said or I'm moving too fast or something, let me know. That said, um, this presentation is usually 90 minutes. Um, and so I'm going to do it in about 30. Um, so um, there's going to be some things I'm going to be trimming out. So I'm going to keep things moving. Um, and so if it's OK, if you do have a question, um, I may actually push that off either to the end or maybe it's just a one-on-one -on -one conversation. And I mean no disrespect. I just want to make sure that we do get through uh, the information. But please stop me if you have a question or don't understand something I'm saying. Get, the chances are the person next year or two over from you has the same question. So it's all about you. Now, the discovery was that these organizations had these frustrations. And then the select few who didn't, there was really something very special about them. And what was special about them was really comes down to one word, and it was focus. They focused their efforts on the right things, which is true in life too, right? If we put our energy, we put our resources, and we put our heart into the right things, we get that back which this is a wonderful group to do that with, the Christian Business Roundtable. Um, and so the focus was, they just found they focused on the right things. And there's 143 things that you guys are wrestling with daily, right? You kind of feel like you got to keep the balls in the air. There's all this stuff that we got to take care of. We found if you focus, bless you, um, we found if you focus your efforts on the six key components of all successful organizations, those other 143 things fall into place. So it comes down to focus, which in some regards shouldn't be you know, a surprise, but it's all about what to focus on. And in business, there's just way too much stuff. And so if you focus your efforts on these six key components and you get good, solid, and successful at controlling them, what ends up happening is those 143 things all fall into place because they're mere symptoms of root problems. And Western society is notorious for taking care of symptoms. You got a headache. You keep having headaches, you just keep taking aspirin or Advil, right? You don't take care of root problems. In business, unless you have unlimited funds, 
And if you do, chat with me after. Um, but if you don't have unlimited funds, um, then ultimately we have to be more effective and e efficient with our approach. So to do that, you've got to focus on the six key components. First one's vision. Oh, I'm sorry, I should point out you're, we're on page three. Jerry, you don't mind if I read over your shoulder, do you? Okay, thank you. Um, we're on page three uh, in your um, uh, booklet there in front of you. That's for you to keep, so please write in it, do whatever you like. Um, if you need another copy, I've, I think I got a couple extras. So vision, vision from the standpoint of getting your leadership team on the same page <coughs> with where the organization is going and how it's going to get there. Don't miss that step. Where the organization is going and how it's going to get there. Your leadership team is the three to seven people at the helm of the organization that is running that organization. Now, if that team has any confusion, let's say there's just a little bit of confusion, we found that that confusion is exponential as you go down. And so by the end of your 100-person organization, the confusion is to a point where they have no idea of what they do, how that adds to your vision. So you've got to get vision crystal clear. Clarity with vision is absolutely essential in organizations. <clears throat> Next is people. People from the standpoint of you need to determine what makes a great person for your organization. So now we have this, this, the clear vision. We know where we want to take the organization. We now have to get the right people in the right seats to make for a successful vision, to get that accomplished. So great people are two things. So you've got to have right people, which is ultimately they care about what we care about. So Jim Collins made this popular. Um, it's actually not his terminology, I've, uh, I've recently found out, but right people is simply this. People sometimes take this too far. It's just simply, do they care about what you care about? Because if they don't care about what you care about, they just shouldn't be there. It doesn't make them bad people. Do they have your values? If they don't, that doesn't make them bad people. They just should work somewhere else. They may be a perfect fit for Duncan Aviation or Structure Tech or, or Nexus Business Solutions, but not for your organization. So um, make sure you have great people. Next, you, you want to make sure those great people are in the right seat. Do they have the God-given talent to do what we're asking them to do? And if they don't, you are doing them an absolute misjustice. You have to make sure that we're getting people who are great at what they do. I'm not saying there isn't training and those kinds of things, but we know that some people are not built to do certain jobs. Does it make them good or bad? They just should be doing something else. So we got to get them in the right seat. But for your organization, that's going to be different. And so you have to figure out truly what it is, what you care about, your core values, and then you have to truly understand what each seat does and really what makes for a very successful person in that seat. Next is data. Data from the standpoint of making sure you know what's going on in your business and not just guessing. What ends up happening for many businesses is they, they run around to all the different leaders to make sure they got a pulse on what's going on. It's a colossal waste of your time and all of the people's energy that you uh, just ran around. You have to have <clears throat> the data that gives you a true pulse in your organization. Now, this has been a secret sauce of uh, successful organizations forever. And so um, if you got to get that data down and a truth in life, I used to say a truth in business, and then one of my clients pointed out to me, he goes, that's kind of true in life, too. I'm like, good point. Um, is the more information you have, the more likely you are to make a good decision. Now, I'm not an economist saying that there's you know, perfect information and you'll have all the information. Let's not kid ourselves. That's never going to happen. Sorry if you're an economist, but that's some type of reality I've never been to. So, but you've got to get good information. It's usually, you can usually get much better information on a weekly basis than you think. Now, organizations that have strong visions, clear visions, I should say, <clears throat> great people, and are running the organization on knowing and not guessing, they end up having a much more tra transparent, open, honest, healthy organizations. And we were talking at the head table here about uh, culture. And another term that's used for that a lot of times is having a healthy, cohesive teams. And health and culture will always trump strategy every time. And so this will help to create that for you. And when that happens, all the opportunities, all the obstacles, all the great ideas, all the problems, all the things getting in your way need to be taken care of. So the most successful organizations in the world 
are the ones who identify and solve their problems better than other organizations. One of my favorite quotes from Steve Jobs, <coughs> most of you've probably never heard. He says that one of the biggest things that set Apple apart from all other organizations is that they were able to identify and solve their problems better than other organizations. Of all the things that Apple does, right? Half of you in this room have got an Apple product in your pocket right now. Um, and so of all the things they do, that's what he said they did better than other organizations. Because we're, we're organizations made up of people, God made us the way we are, which means that, you know, we have our mistakes, we have our faults, so you're always going to have issues. Sorry to say, you're never going to get to a point in your organization where you're like, whew, finally we're at the end of our issues. So you're not going to get there, sorry. If that's the case, you're not going to want to be a business leader. Um, but we always have to get great at solving problems. The problem is, if you're in manufacturing or not, the there's a bottleneck in your organization. Chances are that's you and your leadership team. Because the leadership team or the owners or, or the, the top brass are always solving all the problems for everybody else. And to say it nicely, that's just not the way to do it. We have to teach all of our people to be great at solving problems. They got to be great at identifying and solving problems. So you're not being good to your people if you're not doing this. So. So I have to be a little harsh, but it's just the case. We've got to teach all of our people to be great at identifying and solving their problems. So the bottleneck isn't that leadership team. The whole point of leaders is to make other people great, right? If you're managing people and you're making other people great, that's what you should be doing. This is one of those ways we need to be doing that. Next is process. Process from the standpoint of just being more reliable of an organization. None of you are ever going to get a call from a customer and says, we're not using you anymore because you're too reliable. Not going to get that call. Um, we just want you to be more reliable. A lot of people take process too far, and some people don't take it uh, far enough. And in most organizations, that's, both of those things are happening, right? Well, we have our operations down for our accounting, but you know, um, we don't, or I mean our process, excuse me, our process is down for our accounting, but operations, well, they're on their own. Um, a failed approach in business, and this has been proven 10 times out of 10, is everybody doing it their own way. We can't do that. We have to do it the structure tech way. We have to do it the Nexus way, the Duncan Aviation way. We have to do it the Ameriprise way. Um, whatever that is, you got to get that down. Get your the processes down. Now, do it the 20% that gets you 80% of the results. Standard operating procedures are not used, and it's because they're too onerous. It's just too much. Those binders don't get used. We needed to look at the high level. What's your secret sauce? The 20% that gets you 80% of the results, that's the process that you need to take it down. Figure that out, because people generally don't care what you do. Now, hear me out before you throw something at me. Um, they don't care what you do. They care how you do it. Because the what you can get from many other people. There's other people that have mediation services. There's other people that do construction. There's other people that, that um, ultimately do what I do. But how I do what I do or how Jeff does what he does is the reason people use him. And so that's what we need to do. We have to get the how down. If you don't have your processes down, you don't have the how. So you got to get that down. That's your, a lot of times the secret sauce of the organizations. I guess that's my word for the day, secret sauce. Um, Next is traction. Traction from the standpoint of being great at getting things done. So the most demoralizing thing I see is organizations that have these great visions. And I work with amazing organizations. Um, and they have these beautiful visions. And the, before I get there many a times, what happens is that they have these great visions, but they're not getting there. I hear terms like, we're spinning our wheels. I'm not getting the most out of my people. Um, we can't get good people. Um, we just find that many a times it comes down to they're not executing and implementing as well as they could. Now, there's a cool study done, and I, I loved it, because probably what I do more than anything else is help companies to be great at executing and implementing. And the study showed that organizations that have great visions but aren't good at executing will get stomped every time by organizations that are great at executing and implementing. It's all about getting things done. Um, we got to be moving forward. Um, and so one of my favorite quotes with this is, somebody told me it was Roosevelt, and then I was corrected that it was Eisenhower. So it's one of those guys. Um, so 
smart guys. Um, so one of them said, um, the, best way for, the best way forward is in the right direction. The second best way is moving in the wrong direction. The worst thing you can do is not to move at all. And so, as one of my clients says, um, after I told him that, he said, well, yeah, falling on your face is at least moving forward. I thought, oh well, my god, yeah, I guess if you're coming down, you know, you guys can think of the physics of it, right? I mean, that's moving forward. I'm like, all right, great. You're going to find out a lot more about yourselves by moving in the wrong direction than not moving at all. So we need to make sure that we're getting traction. You've got to be great at implementing and executing on your plans. So that, those are the six key components of your organization. You've got to get good, solid, and successful at each of these. We found that those 143 things, like I said before, all find their way of falling into place because they were just symptoms in these areas. These are the root areas of your organization. If you get to these and you focus your efforts here, and especially the people sitting in your seat, if you're wondering who's the person sitting in your seat, take a look at your name tag, um, that person needs to be the person that is um, making sure where they're focusing on this because all of you are business leaders. You've got to be making sure you're focusing in these six key areas. The 143 things will fall into place. So now we're going to do a little something a little bit different. I'm going to let you all decide where we go from here. So <clears throat> usually these are 90 minute presentations and what I want to do is kind of decide what would be, where could I add more value to you uh, uh, and all the people in this group. So as a raise of hands, tell me who would get the most value out of us taking a deep dive into vision. So raise your hands, who would get the most value out of getting a deep dive into how we dive into vision? Okay? So you and me, we'll, we'll chat later, I guess, because nobody else thinks you're the same. <laughs> um, how about people? Who thinks they could get a lot of value out of people? Raise your hands. Okay? Data. Data. Anybody think they would get some value out of data? There's a couple of us. All right. Well, it looks like we're having lunch, the three of us at some point. Um, the uh, issues, who would uh, get a lot of value out of the issues component? All right, Steve, sorry, um, just you and me. Oh, two, all right, another lunch. Um, and process, who would get some value out of process? Okay, and last, traction. Who would get a, a lot of value out of traction? Oh, it's close, so it's people or traction. Um, so, all right, we'll just do, we'll do a, uh, I would, <laughs> yeah, do both. So Jeffrey wouldn't like that. And Chop Chop, thanks. <laughs> Somebody shut Michelle up back there. Um, sorry, we're friends. Um, so it, people, though, I think won. Um, so we're going to dive into people. If you could uh, please turn to page uh, oop, uh, seven. Yes, page seven. Thanks, David. Page seven. And I probably should flip to page seven, too. All right, like I said, people is right people in right seat. So there's an awesome tool. You have it there in front of you, the people analyzer. What you want to do is you first have to figure out your core values. Figure out truly what we care about as an organization. And you're going to put that across the top, what those values are. These are a client. Um, and then you're going to put the names down the side of the people in your organization. I recommend doing this with your leadership team first and foremost. And then you're just going to determine if most of the time people exhibit that value. Most, uh, some of the time they are, some of the time they're not. This person is a person you never know who you're going to get when they, uh, you walk into the office. And then the last is the person does not exhibit the values most of the time. Now, we're not looking for perfection because none of you are perfect. So when I say plus, it means most of the time you're bringing the value. So the, the people analyzer can help us to get this down um, to make sure, excuse me, um, to, to make sure that we are surrounding ourselves with the right people. Now, don't take this to some moral high level or that your values are what's best for the world. No offense, it's just not the case. It's what's best for your organization. It's the way you were brought up. What we need to do is just surround ourselves with the people that are like that. You will be wildly more successful if you do that. Now, one of my uh, clients pushed back on me and was like, well, diversity is so important. I promise you can have diversity 
and still have, surround yourselves with people who have the same values. Absolutely promise you that. Um, so you need to get this down. It's just a very clear way of doing it. And then you have to set the bar. We set the bar, okay, this is what we're saying. This is what we recommend for organizations that have five values, three pluses and two plus minuses. Um, if they're below the bar, we need to sit down with them and help them, show them why we think they're below the bar and then help them to get above the bar. If we can't help them, then they would be happier somewhere else. How many times have you heard people say, well, we're just a nice organization, so you know, we don't want to, uh, you know, we don't want to fire anybody, or oh, she's just so nice, or you know, they're making decisions for the individual and not the company as a whole. You guys ever heard that? Not in your organization, of course, but in other organizations. Anybody ever heard that? Okay, just just me, I guess. But um, yes, but you guys get it. We need to make the decisions for the greater good, and the greater good is your organization. It's not you. It's not any of the other people. It's for the organization. So let's make sure we're not making decisions for the individuals, but for the greater good. The next is right seat. Can I go back? Yes, yes, sir. Where did those top five come from? Is that, does that change? Is that a vision thing? Is that yeah, so um, all organizations, so that you would have, so if you flip back a page, um, if you don't mind. Um, so you, were gonna, you would go through in the vision um, one, you would go through and ultimately determine truly what is the root what values of your organization. Yeah. And so you'd go through an exercise that does that. Um, and so there's examples of that on page six of, you know, values uh, that you could see. But what you need to do is go through an exercise and truly figure out what that is. Um, and so um, that's the, the best way to do that. So that's very dynamic. That'll change based on organization what you're looking for. On each organization, but it's very undynamic for the organization. We find that values change for an organization just about every hundred years. So the person sitting in your seat's not going to ever change your values. <laughs> the next generation will. You're, um, and so you, it's not going to be dynamic in the organization, but it'll be dynamic per organization. Is that what you meant, I think? Yeah. Okay, good. Um, is that what you were saying too, Jeff? Yeah. Okay. Um, that, that helped, Paul? Okay. Um, next is right seat. Do people have the God-given talents to do what we're asking them to do? <clears throat> to do that, you have to figure out what we're asking them to do. And I'll be honest, most of the organizations that I've ever worked with aren't very clear on what everyone's supposed to do. It may be clear in your head, but is it clear for everyone? And so the best tool that I've ever seen to do this is the accountability chart, <clears throat> which is on page, Paul, what page are we on, sorry? Eight. eight. eight okay, <clears throat> page eight is the accountability chart. And the accountability chart starts off with this. There's a fundamental belief in business, and that fundamental belief is that uh, all organizations only have three main functions. You have to bring in customers, sales and marketing. You have to take care of the customers once you have them. And ultimately, you have to make sure that the money's coming in and out of the organization, and as, as well as all the ad other administrative things that happens in finance and administration. Um, all great organizations are, are strong in each of those key uh, functions. All great organizations also have an integrator. I didn't say CEO, I didn't say president, I said integrator, because an integrator is a person who harmoniously weaves all of this together. Sales and marketing speaks a different language than finance. They do. <laughs> Operations and uh, sales and marketing might not always get along. We need to make sure there's somebody pulling those, that all together. <clears throat> an integrator is a person who's great at details. They're great at making other people great. They're usually a behind the scenes person. Um, and uh, they're usually not the face of the organization. <clears throat> now what you wanna do is you need to determine, now at first everybody's saying, yeah, it's just an org chart, Jim, with a new name. Um, this is where we take it into the accountability chart. You wanna figure out the five roles that that function needs to be great at to be uh, a rock star in their seat. So let's say it's, it's sales and marketing. Um, what do they have to be great at? And if this is a sales and marketing director, they'll have to be great at leading, managing, and hold people accountable. That's the LMA there. Uh, because managing a bunch of uh, sales force is very difficult. If any of you have ever done it, it's not the easiest task. Um, and so we need to make sure we have all of those down that would make the sales and marketing director very good at what they do. And you need to get this down for the whole organization, down to every position. If you have volunteers in your organization, you gotta make it clear for them just as much. 
And so what we do is you, you customize this for your organization. Maybe sales and marketing are in two different boxes. Maybe operations is a couple different boxes. Maybe finance is finance, HR, IT. You're gonna have three to seven. Anything more than that we find doesn't work. Um, it's just not as a, an effective structure. Get that down and then figure out for the whole organization, every role, make sure you got the, what it makes, what makes somebody successful in that role, or I'm sorry, in that function. So underneath sales and marketing, there may be a salesperson. What are the five things they need to do? So we figure this out for the whole organization. Now half the time our organizations look like this. The other half the time, there's a person in the organization called a visionary. The visionary is somebody very, very different than an integrator. The visionary is the person who has 20 ideas a week. One of them might be good, but it's the, that's the idea that takes you to the moon. They are the people that are, are great with the big relationships, but to be honest, lots of times they're not all that great at managing people. They're the people that are built more on emotion. A lot of times they're the founders of an organization. Um, they are these uh, people that are always six steps ahead of everybody else, and whenever they communicate that, everybody's confused because they're like, what the heck is he talking about? Um, so half the time we have a visionary in our organization, and a lot of times visionaries are sitting in that integrator seat, and if they are, organizations are doing these 90-day, woo, everything's going, and boom, it falls apart because these visionaries, absolutely fabulous people, are not great at the follow th uh, details and the follow-through. That's just not their thing, right? Come up with ideas, pass it off to somebody else. Um, and so we need to get them into the right seat. And I think we have squandered the value of visionaries in our society because we've been saying if you own a business, that then you have to do all those details and the follow through and all that kind of stuff. It's just not the case. Get an integrator and your business will take off. There's really cool research that showed that organizations that had visionary integrator approaches uh, were wildly successful. And you guys can probably think of a whole bunch of ideas on, on what a visionary would look like. <coughs> Back to Steve Jobs and uh, Tim Cook being his integrator. Um, so, uh, but in your organization, if you're a visionary, you're in the integrator seat, find an integrator. You'll be uh, absolutely surprised at how much you take off. So the idea here then is we want to get um, everybody into the right seat, and that means you as well. A lot of times everybody's like, well, that's great for everybody else, but not for me. That doesn't work. We need to get you in the right seat so your value is ultimately being absolutely found within your organization as well. So that is the, uh, the people component of, uh, of, this, of the um, EOS system. And obviously, you know, the, there's a lot of details. This, uh, the book has that. Um, and one of the things, um, Jeff's on page uh, nine that I was just looking at, um, one way of ultimately figuring out if they're in the right seat is you go through, do they get it, want it, and have the capacity to do the job. Um, and so those are quick ways that um, you can ultimately determine. And we ultimately just put that right in the people analyzer as well. So you have the values and then you have, are they in the right seat? So um, questions on the people component or other components? Yes, what's your name? I'm sorry. Michelle. Michelle. Uh huh. Chart. Yeah. Um, no, I'm sorry, Michelle. So with the second one, you mean, is there people who are more apt to be in that role or? Oh, in the organization that has integrator, mm -hmm. what kind of role and position and title is that? Is that organizational oh. development? Okay. I got it. Now I got it. Um, thanks. Sorry, Michelle. Um, so first question, if I can, I'll keep them in order here. So Michelle asks, um, so how are we figuring out these roles, right, Michelle? Like, how do we get these roles down and how do we, the God-given talent, how does that connect with the accountability chart? Right? Okay, good. Um, so the, you need to figure out what it really takes to do every role. And so um, I'm going to read over David's shoulder. So the sales and marketing director need to be great at leading, managing, and holding people accountable. They have to be great at sales and ultimately determining the revenue goals. Uh, they need to be good at, at uh, uh, I'm sorry, sales and revenue goals. Then selling, they got to be great at marketing. So these things are the things that you figure out that in this seat, this is what we need somebody to have the God-given talents to do. 
Now, you then want to find somebody. Let's say we're hiring somebody new. We want to find somebody who has those talents. If there's somebody in the organization, we want to say, do you have these talents? Do we all think you have these talents? And if they don't, let's say they, uh, they're not as great at marketing because we've got a salesperson, we're bringing them in, and it's like, okay, can we train him to get up to speed? Because you need to build the structure, and this is a very important point that most companies screw up, you have to build the structure what's right for the organization, not around its people. And so do the structure first and then get the people in there, and then what you find is that then we're determining do they have the God-given talents, and we go through, a, you know, literally, we do it with the leadership team right in front of everybody else. Hey, you know, what are the things, do we, you have what it takes? If not, let's try to get them training. Let's bring them back. Let's get them to what they need. So how that connects is that the accountability chart helps us to know what are those roles that they have to be great at to, so, us, so we know they have the God-given talent. Did they get there? Um, next. Um, what would be an integrator be called in a, no, a normal organization? Because none of you have probably have that on your business card. Um, it a lot of times is a president to a CEO. So the president would be here a lot of times. The person really, the, you know, making it work, making, pulling all the strings, making sure the, the details follow through, and then that would be a CEO sometimes. Um, but the roles and the, uh, of each of the visionaries and the integrator is, uh, this is an example. It would be different for every organization, but on your sheet that it shows. That help, Michelle? Okay, uh, good. I've got another um, couple minutes for some more questions. Yeah, Clayton. I was just going to say, in addition to that, a lot of times the integrator role is taken by somebody else who already has it on the position. So, like in our company, the person who is one of our managers under the operations is a He's also our integrator. So it's not necessarily always going to be just a full-time person doing just integrator job, but a lot of times they can hold other roles as you develop closer to that model. So it can be a process is what I was just letting her. It, it can. Um, the flip of that is we don't find that, sorry, Clean, um, we don't find that to be as, as successful, though. We find an integrator is definitely a full-time role, and in most organizations, that needs to be somebody who's truly making these other leaders great. And so that's a full-time role that we, we find. Sometimes that happens over a process, to Clayton's point. Correct. They have to be great at leading and managing and holding people accountable. So they, a lot of times they have to be respected. Yes, for sure. Other questions? Yes. What's your name? I'm sorry. I'm Nikki. Hi, Nikki. Hi. So your page, the level 10 meeting on 14, is great. Yeah, it's amazing. And can you just give a little Yeah, so um, Nikki was uh, ahead of the class. And so um, <laughs> she is on page 14. Nikki <laughs> can never hold her back, can I'm we? A visionary integrator sales marketer. You're right. <laughs> She is this position. Um, um, so probably one of the geniuses of Gina Wickman who came up with this whole system is the level 10 agenda. Um, and so I'm going to take just a little bit of time and then pull me aside if you don't get what you need. Um, the level 10 agenda is genius in the fact that it helps you do the two things that makes for a great internal meeting. If you're having great internal meetings, then your meetings are holding people accountable and you're solving problems. If your internal meetings are not doing those two things, you're not having good internal meetings. Literally, my teams love to get together. I had a team that was going to be meeting on Christmas Eve, and the, uh, the leader ended up having to be gone, and he said, you know, it's Christmas Eve, guys, why don't we take it off? And they were disappointed that they weren't going to be meeting on Christmas Eve um, because they get so much value out of coming together. They love to meet in their organizations because they use this agenda. And this agenda has a lot of nuances, and Nikki and I are going to talk about that separately at some point. And if you want to, please, you know, there's business cards. Please, I love giving all this stuff away. Let me know. I can give you the tools. But the idea here is that at the top part is just reporting. So our scorecard is the data piece. Are we on track? Are we off track? We're not talking about it. We're just dropping them down. If it's an issue, meaning it's off track, we drop it down. Uh, we have the rocks review, which is the quarterly priorities for an organization. Um, if those are off track, we're just dropping them down to the IDS section, the issue solving. Um, people headlines, it, anything good, bad going on with our people, really quick headlines, we're dropping them down. So we're not discussing stuff at the top. We're making sure that we determine ultimately what we need to solve. 
And then we're bringing some good accountability in. Uh, are our to-dos getting done? In our organizations that we work with, 90% of the to-dos at the leadership team level are getting done every week. So they're getting a lot of traction. If your to-dos aren't getting done in your organization, you're not getting traction that you should. You're asking, are they done, not done? Let's say Jeffrey didn't get one done. Jeffrey, come on. Um, and so it's maybe Jeffrey's saying, OK, we drop it down. And the problem is Jeffrey didn't get his to-do done. He committed. He looked me in the eye and said he was going to get it done, and he didn't. And then we find out Jeffrey's got way too much on his plate. we got to help that. That's the bigger problem. That's the meaty issue. And so if Jeffrey can't live up to his commitments, then we have to figure that out. Um, and so that's what we really do with this is it really starts to uh, make sure we're doing um, what we should be. And then we get to IDS. And there's a whole page on how to do that. But IDS is all about issue solving. It's all about solving. And so we got to make sure that we're doing a good solving of issues. The only way you can solve your issues is if you truly identify them first. If you're in meetings and all you're doing is discussing stuff, then you're missing the point. You have to identify the problem first, then and only then do you discuss and solve. So, sorry, Nikki, that's all the time I have. Okay, you're coming to lunch with me. Okay, well, <laughs> wow, this is great. <laughs> I'm having a good day. Um, so um, I'm sorry, that's about the amount of time I have. If there is other questions, I, I seriously love this stuff. Hopefully my passion for this has come across. Um, but um, I will, I'd love to talk to you. I'll be here for a little bit after, uh, and then i got to run to a client meeting. But I have business cards. Um, there's uh, grab me after if you really want more information. I have books I can give you uh, on this. Um, and if I run out of books, I've got six up here. If I run out of books, give me your business card. I'll get you a book. If you'd like more information, give me your business card, just write on it. Um, so one part of what we do here, and I think it's beautiful that uh, Jeffrey set this up, is that we, uh, we give a, a testimony to uh, how Christ has been brought into our lives. Um, and so I want to uh, finish, well, I want to finish my part with that. Um, and I thought a lot about this. It's a, it's a little unnerving to stand up in front of me. I'm, I do this for a living, stand up in front of people and talk about this stuff, but I don't usually stand up in front of people and talk about how you know, God's been in my life. And uh, thank goodness Jeffrey told me before Christmas that we'd be doing this because I'm at church on Christmas and um, the, the priest says, you know, Jesus, or God gave us Jesus. That was his Huge gift to us, his biggest gift to us. What's your gift? Like, oh, I don't think I can beat that. <laughs> that's, you know, that's a pretty big gift. And I started thinking about that. Like, wow, like, if you really think of that question, what is the beauty you are supposed to bring into the world? And I really took that personally, and I've, I've thought a lot about it and prayed a lot about it. And I started to realize that mine is uh, to help people to find what their beauty is to bring into the world. So um, what, through this process, what we do is we find that people end up doing what they're meant to do. All of us have beauty we're supposed to bring in the world. And in some regards, that is done in a professional fashion. And I say professional, whatever work environment you have, and some of that is at home. Part of the beauty I bring into the world, I think, is being a father. I fail at it every day, but I keep trying, I'll tell you that. Um, and the part of the beauty I'm supposed to bring into the world, too, is I think that work with businesses and help them, to help that business to achieve its dreams. And so the beauty, though, of helping people then to find the beauty they're supposed to bring into the world is, has been an absolute blessing. And God has graced me with the ability to do that. And I, I find that every day I know I couldn't do what I do without God. And so... I'm about to go to a client meeting after this, um, and it's funny that they did it right after this. I'm like, okay, I'm going to be coming and going right to a client meeting, which is an all-day session. And uh, I just, I know when I get up in front of them and I'm helping them that I couldn't do it alone. Um, and so there's things that I say and there's things that end up happening that are beyond me. And I'm not sure if you've ever had that experience. If you have, then you're probably doing what you're supposed to be doing. Um, and so find that in your lives, um, and uh, you'll be blessed. And so that is really how God has come to me. And I think it's, uh, I don't think we talk enough about God in business, in my opinion, um, and why I appreciate so much Jeffrey for doing this. And I think if we can bring God more into it, and I don't mean praying at all of our meals and that kind of stuff, but truly just bringing our beauty, because 
God gave us Jesus, and it's like, okay, I got to step it up because I'm never going to, you know, meet that gift, right? But I got to try. Um, and so that's what I, every day I try to put on those boots and, and go at it. So um, it's been uh, a blessing to me, I will say, and that's, that's all through God. So thank you all for, for listening to me, and um, hopefully there was some uh, little tidbit or a little value you can run with it. Take these um, booklets. I love helping, uh, so let me know if I can help. There's business cards, there's books, there's anything I can do for you, I'd love to help. So thank you all. Thank you for watching this presentation. Perhaps you've never made a Christian commitment. We want to give you that opportunity today. Just a few easy steps. First of all, recognize your need. The Bible tells us that in Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All of us are sinners and must recognize our need for a Savior. By confessing our sins and turning from them, we will find forgiveness. The Bible promises in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Believe in Jesus. God wrought a miracle when he sent his only son to die that we might have life. Put your faith in him and believe in his power to save you. The Bible says in John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. God has given us a great gift in his Son, but we must receive this gift. Thank him for loving and forgiving you and ask him to live in your heart. His promise to us is clear. In John 1.12, the Bible says, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. So Jesus is the atonement, the sacrificial lamb, the remission of sins, just as if we'd never sinned, and the forgiveness. Through Jesus, we have daily forgiveness. And having received his salvation, confess your faith. The Bible assures us in Romans 10.9, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You know, we're all going to die and spend eternity somewhere, either in heaven or in hell. We want to give you the opportunity to pray with us today. Let's bow our head. Lord, I recognize my need for you as my Savior. I confess my sins to you now, and I turn from them, and I ask for your forgiveness, Lord. I believe in you, Lord Jesus, that you died for me, that I might have eternal life with you in heaven. Lord Jesus, I receive you now in my heart, and I thank you for forgiving me. I thank you that you love me. I thank you that you receive me into your kingdom. I believe in my heart that you are my Lord and that God raised you from the dead, that I might be saved and spend eternity with you. I thank you, Lord, that I am now part of God's family and I commit my life to you from this day forward. Amen. And if you've prayed that prayer with us, we encourage you to share that with someone today. Thank you.